All right, welcome back to our study of Revelation. Um, we are now in chapter 9. We still have quite a bit to go, but we're not in any hurry. Uh, as you'll see tonight, just in the three trumpet judgments we discussed, there's a lot of information. So, yep, here we go. It's a good thing I had that. So there's a lot of information here. Uh, as we've, we've already talked about, we're talking about the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, this is the last prophetic period for the Jewish people. That's what his prophecy was given in his book, the second part of the, the book of Daniel. And we, we know that we're in 69th week right now, or well, we're within 69 and 70, right between them, in the period known as the time of the Gentiles. We know how it ends. We know the first trumpet judgment is the peace treaty that is signed between the Arab world and the Jews. Uh, they are given peace so that they can start their sacrificial system again and start building the final temple. So that is coming, that is near, and we've talked about the initial things that happen. You've got that first judgment, which is the peace treaty. That leads to war. The next one is war. The war leads to famine. Famine leads to death. One quarter of the world's population dies in a very short amount of time. So hopefully you remember the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We talked about them. The white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. That is peace, war, famine, and death. Okay? Now, we saw the martyrdom. Uh, now, we talked about this. The church is raptured before it starts. So how do people get saved during the tribulation period? Anybody? Quick review. Jewish, Jewish ministers. 144,000 Jewish men are saved. They have similar experiences like the Apostle Paul had on the road to Damascus. And so you've got these young Jewish men. They know the word. I mean, they, they're, they're bathed in the Word all of their life. And now they realize who Isaiah 53 is speaking of. And so the Word is opened up to them just as it was to Paul. And you saw what Paul did. I mean, Paul basically was the motivator to move the church out of Jerusalem and start spreading it. We exist because of men like the Apostle Paul. But there was only 12 of them. There's going to be 144,000 of these on the planet. Many theologians and scholars believe there will be more people saved during the tribulation period than the time from Adam and Eve until the signing of that treaty. I mean, you're talking a lot of people. Unfortunately, uh, so far we've seen the judgments are on everyone. So even if you get saved during the tribulation period, you're still going to suffer the tribulation judgments. And as a matter of fact, as we'll discuss and, and sometime soon, uh, these Christians will face tremendous persecution. So we don't want to argue anybody into the tribulation period. We want to see them get saved before. That, that's the key. That's our motivation. Now I want to begin tonight's study with investi by investigating a parable that Jesus taught. You can turn with me over to Matthew 13 real quickly. And we're going to, we're going to read this because so many times Jesus taught in parables. And we're like, when's this going to happen? When's that going to happen? Well, this parable we actually are seeing take place in our study in Revelation. It's, it's Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. All right? 14, 24, or 13, 24 through 30. Okay, this is, uh, it says here, here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the worker slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer explained. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied, you'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let them both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds tie them into bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. Okay? Now, just a quick uh, quiz. You can't cheat on a uh, parable quiz. There's special punishments for that. Okay? Let's see the first question. Who is the farmer? Who is the farmer? Who do you think? Drum roll, please. Okay. The farmer is Jesus. Jesus is the farmer. The second question, what is the field? The earth, the world. Exactly. Very good, Garrett. The world. All the people. Or 
are in the world. Who is the enemy? It's easy. Satan. Satan. Thank you. All right. Satan. Okay. He's the devil. He is the enemy. Um, he played in weeds. What are the weeds? Might be a tougher question. Huh? Sin could be. How about this? The unsaved. Okay. He's planted the weeds. It's, the enemy has planted weeds in Jesus' field. We're going to talk about that. Um, let's see. What did the enemy do? He planted weeds. Um, what is the wheat? Christians. I heard somebody whisper. Okay. So, this is the parable. What we are seeing is Jesus is speaking in the first century of what's going to happen at the end times. Okay? We've got Jesus. He is the farmer. He is the plow of the world. You've got the devil who is trying to undermine what he's doing. And what the devil has done has sown weeds among the wheat. What that means is the church. Okay? The church has weeds and the church has wheat. Because there are saved people in the church and there are unsaved people in the church, right? Everybody in the church is not saved. Uh, I wish that were the case. It would be awesome. But it's not true. There are a lot of people who think they're right with God uh, because of their parents were right with God or because they were raised in church or because they do good things for people. They think they're right with God and they go through the rituals right alongside Christians in the church. And so there are weeds and there's wheat in the church every Sunday. And every Sunday. And so the question was, okay, wouldn't it be nice if you could identify the weeds? Right? Because the weeds are what causes a lot of the problems. They may not do it on purpose, but since they think they're saved and they're not really, the Holy Spirit doesn't reside within them. So they wind up being the ones who cause division. They wind up being the ones who cause issues. And in a lot of cases, that's, that's what the church, church has trouble with. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just have, I think it was a Spurgeon, and a yellow, yellow line down there right back is going to heaven. And so you can just check. Say, so, all right, you're not one of them. Get out of the church. Right? But what does he say? He says, don't do it because you'll uproot the wheat. If we actually tried to pull all the unsaved people out of the church, it would be dangerous because two reasons. One, we don't know who's saved and who's not. We may see someone who is not living a life that we believe is, is you know, worthy of the calling that we receive. But it still may be a Christian who's simply not where they need to be. And we may uproot that Christian, that true Christian from the church and do a lot of damage. Or we may have um, collateral damage. We may actually find someone who is not saved. And we, again, we may figure that out. And when we remove them, we may wind up removing other people because they're hurt by it. And so it's not our job to remove the weeds from the wheat. Right? Whose job is it? Jesus' job. And it's coming. The time is coming when they will be separated. And that's what we're talking about. He says what? Let them grow together until the harvest. Let them grow together. We cannot purify the church. That's not up to us. And who knows? Some of those who are unsaved and in the church, maybe there will be a time that they come to know the Lord before the rapture of the church. That's why we don't want them removed. But the time is coming very clearly when the harvest is going to take place. And that's what we're talking about. This is where we picked up from last week, right? We got this uh, eagle going around going terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. First four were tough, right? The first four were harsh. Uh, what did we have? The first trumpet was blown and a third of the vegetation died because we had hail and fire and blood come from the sky. Remember what's going to happen when the third of the vegetation dies? It's going to affect the atmosphere. Because that's where we get our oxygen. And so people living on the earth during the tribulation period, they get to this point, they're going to have a hard time breathing. Because the trees and the grass, they're going to die. And nothing's going to produce oxygen. It's going to be miserable. Second trumpet blows and a mountain of fire is thrown into the sea. A third of the oceans are polluted. A third of the sea creatures die. And a third of the ships are destroyed. Wow. The third trumpet sounds and a large star falls into the fresh water supply and a third of the fresh water is polluted and as a result many people die. Okay. The fourth trumpet sounds and there is one third darkness and okay. the sun, the moon, the stars are dark for one third of its normal time. Wow. Okay. What we're seeing are environmental changes. 
environmental changes. Uh, and as I discussed last week, John had never seen an airplane, John had never seen a tank, uh, John had never seen a gun, John would not have known what gunpowder was, much less what nuclear bomb was, or mushroom cloud, or fallout, or contamination. He wouldn't have known any of these things. And so it really is easy to say, you know what, these first four things, and I can vouch for it, would be the result of a nuclear war. All four of those things very clearly would happen if we actually had a nuclear war. Uh, so we could see that. But now in these next three, we have a hard time explaining these other than this demonic. And this is powerful stuff that we're going to get into tonight. So, all right, this is, this is really important. Um, do I believe that we're living in the last days? Absolutely. We'll talk a little bit about it Sunday morning. Uh, I believe Jesus is ready to part the sky. There's no question in my mind. Uh, the Holy Spirit has kept nuclear war from happening. I have no doubt about that. He's the restraining power in the world. Uh, but rogue nations are buying that technology now. You know that not just China and Russia have it. North Korea has it, and so does Iraq. Or Iran, excuse me. So those are our four. We call four plus ones. Uh, the four, our peers, are all armed with nuclear weapons. And so the day that comes and somebody lets them loose, these things we've seen are going to happen. These things to the environment are going to happen. Okay? There's going to be a lot of things take place just like that. But things are going to get worse. Things are going to get much worse. What's next? Land is polluted. Oceans are polluted. Fresh water is polluted. Air is polluted. Um, wow, you would think people would repent at this point. But they don't. All right? So let's turn to our text. Our text is Revelation chapter 9. Okay? Revelation chapter 9. All right. Yeah, I'm going to do Revelation 9, and then just for continuity's sake, I'm going to skip over here and put your finger in 11, verse 15, so we can get to the last trumpet. This is what says the word of the Lord. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to the earth from the sky, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Remember it says he. When he opened it, smoke poured out, though from a huge furnace, and the sunlight and air turned dark from the smoke. Then locusts came out from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only people who did not have the seal of God in their foreheads. That's 144,000. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, listen to this, people will seek death but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads, and their faces looked like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron, and their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions, and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. In Greek, Apollyon, the destroyer. The first terror is past, but look, two more terrors are coming. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice that said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels that are bound at the great Euphrates River. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of the people of, on earth. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. And in my vision, I saw the horses and riders sitting on them. The riders were armor that was fiery red and dark blue and yellow. The horses had heads like lions, and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. One third of all the people on earth were killed by these three plagues, by the fire and smoke and burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses. 
Their power was in their mouths and their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols they could neither see nor hear or nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders on the witchcraft or, or their witchcraft or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Flip over to 11. Should be on the same page. Verse 15. Then the seventh angel, just to complete the thought, blew his trumpets, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. The twenty-four elders sitting in their thrones before God fell with their faces to the ground and worshipped Him. And they said, We give thanks to You, Lord God, the Almighty, the One who is and what always was, for now you have assumed your great power, and you have begun to reign. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It's time to judge the dead, and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people, and all who fear your name, from the least to the greatest. It's time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. Then, in heaven, the temple of God was opened, and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed, and roared, and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words. It's just eerie to hear these things. Uh, Father, people have tried to represent them through movies and, and thoughts and ideas, but there is just nothing like your truth. And it's very clear that things are getting to a place that it is a great terror, terror like never done before. On this earth and so father i pray that this will this will wake us up this will give us a fresh heart uh, for evangelism it'll give us a fresh heart for the lost around us because no one we should wish no one this fate and so now thank you for the reading of your word help us to understand it and apply it we love you we thank you in jesus name amen all right any observations that you have for the reading of these last trumpet judgments So not rated G stuff. Anybody? Before I take off? Even after all the destruction, people will not turn. That's, that's the catch. The catch is after all that. And remember, the sky's already opened up. That's already happened. They've been able to look into heaven and see who, who is doing all this. So they know. There, there's no question anymore. Right? We don't have to rely on general revelation or natural revelation or even special revelation. The skies opened up, and they can see Jesus already preparing to come, and they still won't repent. Wow. There's a reason there's a heaven, and there's a reason there's a hell. Right? Because people can be stone cold like that. Very good catch. All right, well, let's walk through this. The fifth trumpet, John sees a star falling from heaven. And notice he says, he. This is not a literal star, a burning <laughs> ball of rock or gas. This is a person or an angel, okay? Um, he has keys, and we're going to meet him again later uh, towards the end. So it can be a little confusing, but theologians agree, and, and, and I have to agree. Um, it's not Satan. Satan's going to get cast out later. But this is one of the angels from heaven that's going to do what? What does he do? Opens up the bottomless pit. Wow. I mean, smoke comes up and darkens the day. Just crazy. He opens up the bottomless pit. That's your first thing on your hand out here. He opens up the bottomless pit. And demon locusts are released. And men are tormented five months and cannot die. You've heard the term um, uh, fate worse than death. This has to be where it comes from. Because people are going to be tormented for five months by these demon locusts. And they cannot die. Because death would be better than what they're going to experience. And remember, this is upon everybody except those sealed. And the ones who are sealed are the 144,000 Jews that are saved. Christians are going to be tormented. We call them tribulation saints, by the way, since the church age has passed. And we've had the rapture of the church. Here's some terminology. Uh, tribulation saints is what you call people saved during the tribulation. Uh, so you've got these tribulation saints and they are even being stunned. 
by these demon locusts. And they cannot die. How horrible would that have to be? It's kind of unimaginable. Uh, if you've ever seen a soldier in his full uh, CR CBRN equipment, they've got the big masks and they've got different gear on. So I, I can see this could be an army, but it's, it's possible, that, but I don't think so. Most, most agree these are really something out of a horror film. These are really demons. They came out of the bottomless pit. And so we now have demons unleashed on the earth. Right? Not just spirits behind the walls. Demons released on the earth. Wow. They experienced this for five months. Five months. Okay? The sixth trumpet. Okay? The sixth trumpet goes. Alright? Um, now we have a second terror. There's four angels uh, that had previously been bound. Uh, really, there's only one reason to bind an angel, and that's because they're fallen angels. Most scholars will agree with that. Uh, so these are fallen angels. And there's no indication uh, of who this army might be. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to tell. We know it's an army of 200 million soldiers. Uh, I've heard a few different interpretations. Some say it's a great army from the Orient which we know has a, has a role to play in the end times. Uh, but the Chinese don't have 200 million soldiers today. I mean, I don't know where they would get them. Some try to say it's a Muslim army. There's some arguments for that because you would have a larger army if they would ever combine. Right now, we're, we're fortunate the Holy Spirit causes them to fight amongst themselves, the Sunni and the Shia. Uh, they really hate each other as much as they hate us. Uh, but if the day would come that that would be lifted, then yeah, you can see probably an army of this size. It is possible. Uh, so it, it is it is somewhat possible, but I take a literal interpretation and believe that this is actually an army of demons. I mean, it's literally an army of demons. John does a fairly good description of them. Uh, he recognizes the horses and the heads like lions that breathe fire and smoke and sulfur. And I don't know of any weaponry we have anywhere like that. We've got some that make some stinky smells, but not that actually kill people. Tails with heads like snakes, that's out of a horror movie. So it is, it's possible this could be uh, him just describing some man-made tools and weapons, but I believe this is an army of demons, and, and I get support from people a lot smarter than me. Remember, the bottomless pit's open. The bottomless pit's open. Uh, all manner of demons have been released. Uh, the key is uh, who, who they are is not important. What they do is important. This army of 200 million soldiers slash demons is released, and a third of the remaining population is killed. Wow. A third, right? You have to get to look at the pieces of the puzzle. We had four quarters, one quarter died already of the remaining population, so we've got several billion, or a couple billion dead bodies on the earth. I don't know how you dispose of them, throw them in the water most likely. Um, and so now you've lost a third of the remaining three quarters. That cuts you down to one half of the world population. So one half of the world's population at the time had died in a seven year period. Seven years. You're talking, if it were today, not, not knowing how many Christians are on the earth, you're talking well over three billion people dying within a few years of each other. That's something. I mean, that is terror on earth. Nothing that we can imagine. Nothing of those numbers. Right? Nothing. Now, here's the sad state of men, as Joe Joel brought up. The people who survived don't remain. You know? They can look up and see heaven, and they can see a Savior, and they don't repent. And they know now these are demons. These these can't be human beings. This is demonic. This is supernatural. Oh, but yeah, that's right. There are those aliens. Right? Remember we talked about this. There's the alien theory. Instead of thinking they are demons, they may think they're aliens and may try to appease them. Who knows? Who knows? But men's hearts are still going to be stone cold against God. Just stone cold. And it's, it's something I, I don't understand. I don't get it. Uh, and, and the shame of it is, is, is God still has offered mercy. He's not ended it yet. And we know how God feels about people. God says very clearly, He doesn't hate wicked people. This is hard. Because I don't want to hate wicked people. Ezekiel 33, 11 is one of my memory verses that remind myself of when you know, I'm around people like that. God says Himself, I 
take their pleasure in the death of wicked people. Wicked people turn from their wickedness and do what is just and right. They'll live. So even, even in these last hours, God has offered time for mercy and grace and that they won't take it. Wow. It's just something. It's something that's hard to, hard to believe and get your hands around. I went ahead and read forward so we can finish out the trumpet judgments. Um, this judgment is the literal end of time as we know it. The seventh trumpet judgment. We're going to go back and pick up some other interesting things that in and of themselves will be studies. But things have rapidly come to a close now. And like, like he said, unless the time be short, nobody would survive. That's what Jesus said in all that discourse. That's how bad things are. Um, this seventh trumpet is the end of history as we know it. Right? Uh, this trumpet heralds the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. It's the announcement of his millennial kingdom, which we're going to talk about in great detail. And so here's the seventh trumpet. Jesus Christ physically returns to earth, and it's going to be the judgment of men and the establishment of the millennial kingdom. And I love talking about that. That's going to be a really neat study. This is the worst terror of all, because this is the end of the period of grace or mercy. Once Jesus steps foot on the earth, no one's going to get saved. It's over. He came the first time, right, as Savior. He comes this next time as judge. Right? Judge. He will fight this battle as we will see all on his own, that will be with him. Uh, many believe, and I strongly agree, that this is the period when the bowls of wrath are going to be poured out. We will cover those. Uh, and they are horrible. When we get to chapters 15 and 16, we'll see those. Uh, this is literally the greatest terror of all, of all times, when Jesus steps foot. Where does Jesus step foot? Anybody? Mount of Olives. As prophesied by Zechariah, Jesus will step foot on that day on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Lord my God will come, and all His holy ones with Him. So first, the first part, Mount of Olives. It's really neat when you look uh, north, south, east, west. Um, when you're sitting over on the Mount of Olives near the Garden of Gethsemane, you, you look down into the valley and you look at the eastern gate and you can see if, you, if, if it were there, the temple just beyond the eastern gate and that's the holiest place in the city. It's just opposite of the Mount of Olives. Now, what the Muslims have done, and I've told you about this before, they have buried their dead in front of the eastern gate. They have made it a graveyard because they think that defiles it. They, they, they know that Jesus is supposed to return. They think they can block his return by planting their dead bodies of Muslims on that ground. Isn't that crazy? They've even bolted it up, the gate. The gate is blocked up and sealed. You can't go through it today. You think that's going to stop Jesus when he puts a foot on him? Absolutely not. He's going to go down that path and, and it's eerie, isn't it? Because this is the path he came down on his triumphal entry. It's the same place. He came down on the back of the donkey that time, right? Giving them the opportunity to accept him. He rode in and went into the temple, right? He literally went all the way into the temple and shook his head and left. He came back the next day to do some cleansing. This time he's not going to shake his head and leave. He's going to go through that gate, cross those tombs, go into the temple, which will be built by this time because the Jews have gotten the temple mount back. So they'll have a temple, and he'll go in and take his rightful place, where he'll rule and reign for how long? Yeah, for a millennial kingdom. And we will get to that, right? We will get to that. But this is what's happening in the seventh trumpet of judgment. The seventh trumpet of judgment is Jesus is stepping foot on the earth. And wow, this is impressive when you think about that. Uh, but obviously, you don't want to be here to see it. Who comes with him? We do. Okay, church is raptured. It's been up in heaven. Several things going on in heaven that you can see on your handout if you still have it. Many believe the marriage supper of the Lamb is taking place. Many believe the beam of seat of Christ is taking place where Christians are re receiving their rewards for their faithfulness. Uh, so many believe those are the things going on in heaven during the seven year period. Uh, but we don't stay around playing harps in the crowds with white robes on them. We come with him. Because guess who's going to rule and reign with him in the millennial kingdom? We are. We'll have jobs, which is really cool. We're going to talk about that. Okay? So that's the seventh judge, or seventh judgment from the trumpets 
And so, uh, as we've been discussing, there will be a greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. Okay? Jesus is going to make things right. He's going to make things right. Now, the one word I want to leave you with is the last thing on your handout is the word imminent. Imminent believes there means he can come at any time. There's nothing else that has to be done. Jerusalem has, or Israel has gathered. They are a nation. Um, and that's one of the last things that needed to take place before the return of Christ. So everything prophetically in the Bible that is said will take place before the beginning of the tribulation period has taken place. The next thing to happen in the history of mankind is the rapture of the church. To be followed by the beginning of the tribulation period. Okay? So, anyway, that's what the study is all about. Um, we want to make sure we, allow, we don't get scared of this. This shouldn't scare you if you're a Christian. Okay? You are protected from the wrath, the Bible says. This is very clear that you will protect us from the wrath. We're not going to experience this. So I don't teach this out of fear as some do. I don't try to scare people into heaven this way. Uh, Christians, we should have no fear of this. This should just be information for us that motivates us so that the people we love and care about will have the chance to evangelize them and reach out to them because they're going to face this if it happens tomorrow. And it could. Okay. And it could. What's our song? Page 87. Page 87. Would you stand with us, please? <laughs>